In this video I'm going to take a look at some past paper questions based around the topic of gravitational and electric fields. So let's start from the beginning. So I suggest you take a second, pause the video and read through the question. But I will continue as if you have stopped it and done so. Okay, so we've got a small mass on a line joining. So let's just draw a, a diagram for this. So we've got M1, M2, and some point on this line. So we've got this mass here situated there. And tell, the question tells us that distance there is R1, and that distance there is R2. So if it's going to experience no resultant force, that means the force from both of them must be equal to each other, equal and opposite. So the force from the first planet is just using Newton's law of gravitation. And we can have a lot of terms that can cancel out. So obviously these M's are going to cancel, these G's are going to cancel. And what you get left with is two squared like this. So we need to rearrange this so we get R1 over R2. So if we take the M2 across the other side and the R1 across the other side, we get M1 over M2, or 1 over R2 squared, which means R1 over R2 square root of M1 over M2. So we've got answer C here, and if you look up where I've already wrote down the solutions at the start, you can see that it is C. Okay, so let's move on to the next question. So, which of the following graphs correctly shows the relationship between the gravitational force and the distance r between them? Now, what you should know from Newton's law of gravitation is force is proportional to 1 over r squared. Okay, it's a basic thing, you just have to know that. Obviously, the full equation is gm m over r squared. But the important part of it is this one here at the top. So let's have a look at the relationships that are being shown. So on A, we've got F is proportional to what? Let's have a C here. So we've got as R increases, so some sort of minus constant R we've got there. Uh, this one, we've got force is proportional to 1 over r. Again, not showing 1 over r squared. We've got this one, f is proportional to minus r squared, shown there. Then we've got f is proportional to 1 over r squared, shown by this one. So we get the answer being d. This is the only one that shows the correct relationship there. So we've got this third question here, which one of the following statements about electric field strength and electrical potential is incorrect? So let's go through these one by one to analyse them correctly. So electric potential is a scalar quality. This is true, it's just a fact that you must know when you're looking at this field's part of the course. You just have to know that. And you also have to know that electric field strength is a vector quantity. Why? Well, you can add two of them together to get a resultant, so that makes it a vector quantity. So those are things you just have to know, and if you don't know them, these questions are going to trip you up every time. Let's have a look at this fourth question here. Potential gradient is proportional to the electric field strength. So let's calculate the gradient of a potential. So we need potential is q over 4 pi e0r. 
which I'm going to write in a more useful format for taking the derivative of, because that's what you're doing if you're calculating the gradient. Oh, crumbs, what am I writing? What absolute nonsense. Q over 4 pi e0 multiplied by r to the power of minus 1. So if we take the derivative of that with respect to r, so d dr, it's going to be minus q 4 pi e 0, and it's going to be r to the minus 2, which is going to equal over 4 pi e0 r squared. So now we've got this r squared term on the bottom line. So that is going to be proportional to the electric field strength there. You have, apart from this minus sign, which you might not necessarily know about in terms of field strength because you're only ever required to calculate the magnitude of field strength, this is definitely proportional to electric field strength, which means this fourth one here must be true. So it's looking like it's the third one, but I still want to give you some evidence that this one's correct, because on the face of it, actually, this one looks like it should be true, in fact, given the equations that you know. But I want you to consider a parallel plate, two parallel plates, one at 1,000 volts and one at zero volts, okay? So we've got a potential difference, and so we know that the field strength in there, if we consider a uniform field, is V over D. Now, as we move them further and further apart, and we D tends towards infinity, the field strength is going to drop towards zero as d tends to infinity, e is going to head towards zero. However, at this point here, the potential is still clearly 1000 volts. So field strength is, as d heads towards infinity, heads towards zero, but potential there is still 1000 volts. So you've found an example where actually field strength is zero, but potential is not. And that is key in identifying that this one is false. So let's have a look at question four. If the potential difference between a pair of identical parallel conducting plates is known, what's the only additional knowledge re required to determine the field strength between the plates? So if we have a uniform field, straight away you should be thinking E is delta V over D. So if you know the potential difference, you know delta V, all that's left to know is the D which is the separation of the plates. That one's nice and simple. So, the potential difference in terms of gravity now between the surface and a point B, 10 metres above the surface, is 8 joules per kilogram. Assuming it's a uniform field, what is the value of gravitational field strength in the region between the planet surface? Okay, so let's have a look at some of the key information here. First of all, assuming a uniform field, so just like before, we've got two points, we know that potential difference is 8 joules per kilogram, So, and we know that the separation D is 10 metres. So E equals delta V over D which is 8 divided by 10 gives you 0 0.8 per meter squared to the minus 1, which is the first one. So nice and simple. Take the acceleration due to gravity GE as 10 meters a on the surface of Earth. The acceleration due to gravity on the surface of the Moon is GE over 6. An object whose weight on Earth is 5 newtons is dropped from rest to other surface moon. What is its momentum after 3 seconds? There's a lot going on here, but first of all, we need a find to find a way of calculating the velocity after 3 seconds, and then 
we can turn that into momentum. So how are we going to get about that? Well, we need to know what the acceleration is on the moon. And we know that it's GE over 6, which means... So G, um, it's GE over 6, which is going to be 10 divided by 6. Okay, we also know that on the moon there is no atmosphere, which means there's no air resistance, which means we can apply super equations nice and easily. So the one we're going to need equals u plus at if it starts from rest v equals at equals 10 over 6 times 3 which is equal to 5 meters per second. Now we need to know what the mass is so we can multiply it together. So you're told that the weight on earth is 5 newtons and you know weight is mg, which means that m is w over g, which equals 5 divided by 10, which equals 0 0.5. And the last thing, p equals mv, which is 5 times 0 0.5, which gives you 2.5 kilogram meters per second. So that should be nice and straightforward. This one, an experiment to pass a very high current through a gas, a bank of capacitors of total capacitance, 50 microfarads. So first of all, you need to be thinking, oh, we've got microfarads, so we're going to have a unit conversion. And we've got 30 kilovolts, so again, we're going to have a unit conversion. If they're going to be discharged completely in this amount of time, what would the mean power delivered? So if you're thinking power, you need to be thinking energy divided by time. So time we have, so we need to calculate what the energy is. So the energy stored in aggressors is half CV squared, which is going to be half times 50 times 10, which is the minus 6, times by 30 times 10 to the 3 squared. So... To get power, we're going to divide that all by time, so and so we have on the bottom line 5 times 10 to the minus 3. And if you put that all into your calculator, you will come out with 4.5 times, times 10 to the 6 watts, which is 4.5 megawatts. So you've given me the following data about two planets, and the bit, for some reason, didn't come up on this presentation, so I've just scribbled it in here, is that the field strength on P is 13.4 newtons per kilogram. So, so, first of all, we need to work out the difference in mass between the two planets. So Q have a look here, it's going to have, if it's got double the radius, that means its volume is going to be t times 2 cubed, it's going to be times 8 for volume. But if density is half, so in terms of it's the change in mass, the change in the mass we've got here is going to be times 4. So we've got 4 times as much mass. However, if we look here, our radius has just dub double. So we think about calculating field strength. So we've got GM. Oh. I'm not sure where I wrote the second in there, I need to be a bit more careful. Over r squared. So if we look at the field strength on q relative to p, on the top line, we've got 4 times mass of p. But on the bottom line, we have 2 times the radius of p squared, which is going to end up with 
4 raised to the p squared over g m for g m p. So if we cancel these 4s, we'll find actually that these the, the 4s cancel on top of line and you actually get identical field strength on Q. So that's why it's this one here. So it's, it's simply a case of identifying, well, how much is the mass bigger four times? How much is the radius bigger two times? But remembering that radius gets squared on the bottom line, so actually that has an effect of times four. So you times four on the top line, times four on the bottom line, cancel out, the field strength are actually identical. So a satellite is an orbit height h above the surface of planet of mass m and radius r. What is the velocity of the satellite? So this is a classic equating centripetal force and the gravitational force. So you know that if it's in orbit, the force pulling into the orbit of the planet must be equal to the centripetal force, which is going to be m v squared over r. Let's do some cancellation. Let's get rid of our m's, get rid of some r's, and you get left with g m over r is equal to v squared. Now remember in this, this r is going to actually be made up of the radius of the planet plus the height above the planet. And then obviously we need to square root to get to an answer. So we've still got GM on the top line, but we've got R plus H on the bottom line, all square rooted, which you can see matches what we've got written here. So whenever you're dealing with satellites, you always need in the back of your mind, or oh, I might be having to equate the Newton's law and the centripetal law of acceleration is just something you think about. It comes up a lot in questions. So last one I'm going to look at is here. We've got a diagram showing how the electrical potential varies along a line x to x dash. What will the electric field strength at point P be? There we go. So we can see that the potential at these points is varying in a standard so it's always 10 volts for 0.5 so that means the potential at, at P is actually going to be 25 volts so it's going to be exactly half there because you can see that there's a clear relationship going on so if we want to know what the field strength is in this gap we need to know what the change in V is and we need to know what the change in R is. So the change in V is 30 minus 25, as you can see there. And the change in the radius, if you like, in there is 0.5 divided by 0.5, which is the same as multiplying by 2. So you get 10 volts per meter, which obviously is this B here.